Henry Deering and I'd like to share with you a subject that I believe is of paramount importance to us today. The title of my presentation is A Time to Watch and Pray. My goal is to shed some light on this and help our listeners to understand what the Word of God has to say about this very important topic. May the Lord richly bless you as you view this short video. Before we study the Word of God, I would like to begin with a short prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity and privilege to study your Word on this subject. I ask for the Holy Spirit's presence so that our minds and hearts may be open to understand and take to heart the message for today. We pray this in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The great clock of God with its minute hand is rapidly approaching the midnight hour. With overwhelming speed, the inhabitants of the earth are arriving at their final destination. The prophetic timetable is announcing the end of the world with amazing accuracy. This means that soon Jesus Christ will return the second time to save his children and destroy the wicked. However, before his second coming, God in his great love sends warnings so that people may prepare for this, the greatest event yet to come. One of these warnings is found in 1 Peter 4 verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Be he therefore sober and watch unto prayer. A lone man traveling all night on a rocky mountainside became exhausted and came face to face with death. The road behind them was too dangerous to go back in the darkness, and before him was a large boulder which he did not dare attempt to scale. The only thing left for him to do was to wait until morning. His place of retirement was a steep, dangerous slope. Just one careless move might prove his destruction. He knew that he would have to be vigilant or else he would slip and be hurled to his death in the valley below. In this night of sin, the Christian finds himself in a situation similar to that of the lone traveler. He can't go backwards, but must must patiently wait and be alert until daybreak. Awareness of his precarious position motivates him to watch so that the enemy may not destroy him in his sleep. The danger of being deceived should be very real to us. The devil has many ways and methods whereby he attempts to lead us astray. Before me is a religious newspaper it is filled with some incredible teachings. For instance, the exact day, month, and year are given when the judgment of the living is supposedly to begin, as well as the time of Jesus' return. Doesn't this deception contradict the explicit teaching of the Bible? Remember Christ's prophecy? But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Matthew 24, verse 36 and 42. Because we do not know the exact time, God gives us the solemn warning to watch. Excuses for not watching. There is a class of people of whom Christ spoke thus. But if that evil servant says in his heart, My master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and in an hour that he is not aware of. Matthew 24, 48 through 50. There are many Christians who have an intellectual knowledge of the scriptures and even profess to believe in the second coming of Christ. But they do not know God intimately. Therefore, they love the world 
and not Jesus as the Savior. Perhaps there are even members of a church who are actively participating in Bible study classes and other missionary activities. Despite the superficial involvement in the church activities, these worshipers may be saying, oh, don't come back too soon, Jesus. I'm enjoying this world. I still want to finish my education, get married and have some fun yet before I retire. Please, Lord, don't interrupt my plans for the future. I don't have the time to fully surrender to you. I have more important things to do right now than to watch and pray. This is the attitude of the self-centered, sin-loving person. Consider these all-important words for our day. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. James 4, verse 4. What not to watch. <clears throat> one, of the e one of the easiest things for us to do is to watch others and to forget to watch self. As we look at others' faults, weaknesses, and their many character imperfections, we tend to compare ourselves with them and are very likely to lift ourselves up and become critical and judgmental. Here is an inspired statement from a Christian author on that subject. Thus, those who condemn or criticize others proclaim themselves guilty for they do the same things. In condemning others, they are passing sentence upon themselves, and God declares that this sentence is just. He accepts their own verdict against themselves. What to watch? Since we are living on the borders of the heavenly Canaan, our responsibility today is to critically watch ourselves rather than our fellow believers in the church. We just cannot afford to be critical. Let us resolve to be more critical of ourselves and more tolerant of others. In the New International Version of the Bible we read, Watch your life, 1 Timothy 4 verse 16. This means that our spiritual lives need to be examined in the light of the Ten Commandments. I'm sure you have already heard that we can take only our characters to heaven. If this is so, then we need to put special emphasis on character development or Christ-likeness. This solemn thought prompts us to consider every aspect of our lives. Without a doubt, we need to watch our words that we speak so freely. If this were done, family and church squabbles would end. Heartaches, sadness, and misunderstandings would be things of the past. Let us watch because death and life are in the power of the tongue. Proverbs 18, verse 21. Another area where attention should be focused is our health. Man is eating and drinking to his own glory thereby making his belly a god. His unsanctified appetite is idolized and worshiped every day. Frequently, the worshipers go to such extents as to become gluttons. Gluttony is a perversion of a natural, God-given appetite or drive. When a normal hunger is extended greedily into abnormality so that it harms the body and dulls the mind, it becomes sin. Have you ever lost control of your appetite, overeating even on nutritious food, and then finding it hard to keep awake during the church service? Of course, gluttony is not only the sin of overeating, it can be the sin of drinking, of staying up too late, losing needed sleep in order to 
satisfy ambition or greed. Gluttony can also be indulged in by married couples who have not used self-restraint and temperance in their relations with each other. Christians who have a concern for the health but have a problem living up to the light should watch and pray for divine help. There are others, on the other hand, who can master their craving for food but fail to watch their personal appearance. They are following the foolish, vain, and ridiculous fashions of the world. Perhaps their showy, self-centered attire is a cover-up for their emptiness and lack of peace. Have you ever looked at yourself in the mirror and asked yourself, would Jesus approve of my clothes as I walk into the church, go to the lake, or go to work? Remember, Jesus is watching us as the investigative judgment in heaven is in session. Besides this fact, he will soon appear in the clouds of heaven to clothe us in immortality. And before this spectacular event takes place, we are being warned by the signs of the times to get ready. Every calamity, earthquake, war, misfortune, and crime committed knocks on the door of this doomed planet to tell us something. During the first century, the Italian city of Pompeii was a thriving resort of the Roman Empire. It was located approximately six miles south of Mount Vesuvius and covered an area of some 160 acres. This city of wealth, pleasure, and immorality had a population of 20,000 people. On August 24, AD 79, life was going on as usual. Housewives prepared breakfast for their families, the bread was in the oven, eggs were on the stove, men were going to work, children played in the streets, and the shops were open for business. On that day, no one noticed anything out of the ordinary about the 4,000-foot mountain. At one o'clock in the afternoon, the city was shaken by a violent earthquake, and then Mount Vesuvius erupted with the sound of a thunderclap. The first explosion spewed out of its crater lethal gas, ash, and smoke that rose high into the sky. The people were terrified, and thousands fled at once to the sea and kept going until they were out of danger. Unfortunately, <clears throat> there were some who disregarded the explosion and remained behind. Many delayed in leaving the doomed city. Some stayed to bury their valuables, while others loaded their possessions onto small carts. As they wheeled their overloaded carts, the people merged toward the narrow city gates, which created a terrible traffic jam. At that moment, the angry mountain sent forth its deadly gases and volcanic ash over the city, and the terrified people perished. They were mostly the wealthy who refused to abandon their precious homes and possessions, hoping that the danger would pass after the first explosion. Of the 20,000 inhabitants of Pompeii, 16,000, four-fifths of the entire population perished under 30 feet of volcanic debris. Thus, the thriving city of pleasure and commerce became a huge burial ground. What lessons can we learn from this terrible tragedy? For one thing, our possessions should not hinder us as we travel to our place of refuge, the heavenly kingdom. We are not to hold on to overloaded carts at the expense of eternal salvation. Another lesson we can draw from the history of Pompeii is that after the first explosion of Vesuvius, there were people who delayed leaving the city. It was this delay that cost them their lives. They were victims of the paralysis of procrastination, a spiritual disease that affects a person's attitude and better judgment. 
The Bible cites several instances of people who procrastinated too long. For example, Paul's witness to the Roman governor Felix. Now, as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. Acts 24, verse 25. Though deeply impressed, Felix abruptly ended the interview with those faithful words, When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. Another similar case of the paralysis of procrastination is found in Acts chapter 26. Paul there appealed to a Roman official named Agrippa about the truth, whose reply was, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. But almost means to be lost. He also procrastinated, and there's no record that Felix or Agrippa ever turned to the Lord. Though convicted, they ended up rejecting the offer of salvation. The city of Pompeii is an example and a startling object lesson for those living in the last generation of Earth's history. Mount Vesuvius erupted when the people were totally unprepared for the catastrophe. The sudden and violent explosions came at a time when the people did not foresee any threat of danger from the volcano. For 16 years before the explosions, the inhabitants of the city witnessed Vesuvius puffing out of smoke and vapors. It was a constant sign and warning of danger. This is very similar to what will happen just before Jesus returns. The wicked will see the smoke warning through the signs of the times, but will ignore them. They will continue to transgress the Ten Commandments until a final explosion that will terminate all of civilization. Jesus says to all people in the world, But of that day and, and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son but the Father. Take ye there, take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Mark 13, verse 32, 33, Matthew 24, verse 44. The sudden and unexpected destruction that came to Pompeii gives us an idea of what it will be like at the end of the world. People will be carrying on life and business as usual. Men are still eating and drinking, planting and building, marrying and giving in marriage. Merchants are still buying and selling. Men are jostling one against another, contending for the highest place. Pleasure lovers are still crowding to the theaters, horse races, gambling hells. When the scorner, the rejective of truth, has become presumptuous, when the routine of work in the various money-making lines is carried on without regard to principle. When the student is eagerly seeking knowledge of everything but his Bible, Christ comes as a thief. Before Jesus comes, the liquor shops, gambling casinos, theaters, and nightclubs will be very busy. In millions of homes, the radio, television sets, computers, and mobile phones will be turned in to the usual programs of violence, immorality, and foolishness. It is at the end of the time of trouble that the wicked will be interrupted in their selfish plans. They will appear from outer space, Jesus Christ, the King of the universe. At that moment, the terrified people will be praying to the unstable mountains and rocks to fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Revelation 6 or 16. They will see a cloud of angels accompanying the conquering Jesus. They will seek shelter, but it will be too late. In that hour, there will be no opportunity to repent. It is at the day of the Lord when a just reward will be given to everyone. Therefore, Jesus says to watch ye therefore and pray always 
that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Luke 21, verse 36. May God be with us. Amen.